I'm here today with Justin R. Phillips. Justin is the author of the recently released book, Know Your Place, Helping White Southern Evangelicals Cope with the End of Their World. He's the executive editor for The Other Journal and teaches theology and ethics in Knoxville, Tennessee. Justin earned a PhD in Christian ethics from Fuller Theological Seminary, where he studied how white evangelicals in the South responded to the civil rights movement. His dissertation was more or less a form of therapy in dealing with whiteness and biases. Prior to Fuller, he earned a Master of Divinity from Duke Divinity School, focusing on ethics and practical theology. And you can learn more about Justin at justinrphillips.com. So Justin, it's so wonderful to have you here with us today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brian. Um, I should have mentioned also that Justin is an alum of uh, one of our Writing for Your Life events, so we'll, we'll talk about that later. But um, first, I'd love to hear more, Justin, about your background than just that brief introduction that I gave. Sure. Well, I, I kind of jokingly said that writing the dissertation was almost like a form of therapy. And uh, so I'm, I'm a lifelong Southerner, and it's, uh, I think, since entering divinity school at, at Duke, and then even before starting the dissertation at Fuller, I was beginning to sort through some of the issues that we're, we're still dealing with today with racial polarization, um, overt racism, the kind of like the long-term effects of white supremacy. And so for me, that, um, that's been a long, slow process of kind of not only just learning about history or learning about kind of contemporary movements whether in academia or outside of academia, but really just trying to understand the effects of all of these histories upon me and within me. Uh, and so I think that the, as my studies deepened, I, I kind of began to learn like, oh, you know, white supremacy is, it's alive and well. And it's also, it has had its effects on me too. Even though I would like to believe that like, I'm one of the you know, enlightened souls that are out there or like, you know, I'm not racist. Uh, white supremacy is something that is even kind of seeped into the, the kind of like oxygen that I've breathed for most of my life. So a good bit of this project is sort of like it's personal reflection merged with sorting through these various histories of racial formation and Southern history and, and evangelical Protestantisms. Um, complicity in, in, in those things, too. So um, before we get into the book, can you tell us about the other journal? What is that? And, and what, uh, what, what, you're, you're executive editor, but what, what does that look like? Right. That, the, so the other journal is an online journal. We are housed with the Seattle School of uh, Theology and Psychology. Um, obviously, the, the other journal team were spread out not only all across the country, we're spread out across the world. So our editorial team is a great uh, bunch of folks. And the other journal is we're dedicated to exploring the intersection of theology and culture. And so we have a, uh, we routinely run pieces in theology, in uh, creative writing, in art, uh, in praxis section, which tends to be from people either uh, pastors, pastoral counseling. Uh, we run uh routinely run poetry and it's a it's an amazing group of folks to work with so uh, one way to describe it is that it is it's maybe a little bit headier stuff than you might find in your uh you know off the off the rack christian publications but it's not so um esoteric as what you might find in academic journals uh that are peer reviewed so we we kind of split the difference and we always end up recruiting a great collection of writers um, every, every uh, little cycle. We try to do two issues a year. We're continuously publishing online, and then we'll put out print journals. Um, tend to put out a couple of print journals twice a year. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you, if it was print or just online only, or what the... Largely online, and then we, we try to select some of the, the best of the best for our print journals. Okay, so for at least the online version, if not the print version, I mean, are you open to submissions from, you know, people who have not written in it before? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the fun things about the other journal is that uh, for many people, the other journal will end up being their first publication. 
And we've got a really rigorous uh, editorial process of where I, we really pride ourselves on guiding writers through a process of like, you know, we are, we are here to build you up, not tear you down. We're, we're going to put a number of sets of eyes on your essay uh, or on your sort of like, at some points, pretty rigorous piece. And we're going to, we're going to like really help you understand what the publishing process is. And so the editorial process sometimes feels, feels pretty painful for first time writers, but uh, I almost universally, everyone's pretty pleased with, with what we kind of put together. It's a collaborative effort, but at the same time, I think the author always feels like that's still my piece. You guys just helped make it just a, a little bit better. Good. That's exciting. I didn't know about this. And so I'm glad you mentioned it. And um, I'd like to help you get the word out about it, you know, into the writing for life and publishing and color communities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we, you can find us at theotherjournal.com. We post call for papers. Uh, and so right now we are looking for submissions on the topic of organizing. And so an, an organizing is kind of broadly defined. We've got a pretty lengthy call for papers. So you can find that on our website. And uh, we'll be looking to start publishing those in fall of 2021. Excellent. Okay. So Justin, you mentioned that you also teach. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, what kinds of uh, teaching that you've been doing here lately? Yeah, um, I've, I've taught primarily at the undergraduate level, but I, I had a uh, three years of teaching in a uh, private Christian high school, which I think served as the fodder for a lot of inspiration for the book. But I've, I've taught the high school level and the undergraduate level and uh, in, at the graduate level too. So most of my teaching happens at Carson Newman University in Jefferson City, Tennessee. And some with the undergraduates and some with the, the graduate students who are uh, in our Masters of Arts and Theology program. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. So now, you know, kind of getting to into the book, you know, what led you to write it and publish it? Yeah, well, I, I said earlier, it's it, part of it is just kind of like working through my own histories, the own communities that have shaped me. The, the, the most straightforward path for the book was I wrote a dissertation a, a number of years ago on how uh, white evangelical uh, white Southern evangelicals responded to the civil rights movement. And so I wanted to kind of take a look at a historical event uh, and focus on maybe the, the characters in the, the story that weren't necessarily the main characters of the, you know, maybe the activist community. Uh, and I got that idea, I guess, when I was an undergraduate student, David Gushy was my ethics professor. And uh, David's dissertation and then eventual book was The Righteous Gentiles of the Holocaust. So that kind of sparked this interest of, oh, that's not necessarily the, the group that you would focus on when you're trying to learn about the Holocaust. And so it kind of planted this seed of like, if I were to, if I were to ever do doctoral work, I think I'd want to do something uh, in that area. And so I, I studied, studied for the dissertation, wrote the dissertation, and and found a lot of like amazing kind of heroic stories of white Southerners who joined the civil rights movement or were in, they were involved in anti-racism efforts before it was labeled anti-racism. And, and post dissertation though, I began to like look at what was happening in our current political landscape. And I began to notice like a lot of people noticed uh, many parallels to that kind of like Brown versus Board of Education and civil rights movement era that was happening here. So I wanted to try and like figure out if there was a way to communicate to these communities that have shaped me. So white Southern evangelicals, is there a way to communicate to them right now? Hey, here's what I think is happening. Here's, this book is kind of a, a crash course for you to build up your awareness. Um, and it should by no means be the only book you read on these subjects. But if you're 
a little bit bewildered right now as to what's going on in the world. Like, let me try to explain you how um, being white, being a white Southerner, and how being, if you're an evangelical Protestant, being a white Southern evangelical hasn't helped you sort through some of these issues uh, through your upbringing. Very, very interesting. Um, so what's been the reaction to the book so far? I realize it's re relatively recently released, but uh, what have you found? Yeah, it, it, is, it is relatively uh, still new and people are still finding it. The, the reaction so far has been very positive. Uh, and the, the, the positive response has largely come from people saying like, um, hey, I'm glad you kind of took this certain tone of like confessing and guiding me through this formation rather than browbeating me. Um, and so that, that made for an interesting writing process because I was wrapping things up last summer with the Floyd murder had taken place. There was, of course, all the Black Lives Matter protests that had happening. And I felt like probably a lot of people, a lot of anger. And, and the impulse was to just, you know, drive all of that into the book and, and make this a kind of like a piece of righteous anger. And, and so it was really like a daily discipline to go, okay, remember who you're writing for. Remember like the the tone that they need to hear these messages packaged in. And so sometimes I, you know, I wondered if I was doing a disservice to the material, doing a disservice to people who had quite literally sacrificed their lives for these movements. But I just kept coming back to this need to like translate and translate well for uh, like people who taught me in Sunday school class you know, 25, 30 years ago, and just trying to keep them in mind about uh, like writing for them and writing in a way that if they make it to the end of the book, they'll certainly know more than what they did. And maybe they'll be even open to the conversation that is really um, kind of flourishing right now, that they won't shut out the conversation, but they'll actually be open to, to taking part in it in some small way. Well, that's excellent. I mean, I, I hope that that approach is very helpful. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> so um, can you tell us more about the content of the book, how it's organized, you know, what are the different subtopics? Yeah, yeah. so I, br I broke the book up into three parts and I broke them up into the communities that shaped me. So in the, the title is Helping White Southern Evangelicals Cope with the End of the, Their World. So I broke it up into three parts of focusing on this identity of what it means to be white, the second identity of what it means to be a white Southerner, and then the third of what it means to be a white Southern evangelical. So I kind of layered it, you know, a little bit like a cake. And it was a way to say these communities, a, a, a racial community, a regional community, and a religious community have all formed um, a lot of us, it's shaped our racial imagination. And these communities um, have a lot of the same overlapping blind spots. They begin to reinforce one another. So I think in some ways, if, if you're white, it can be difficult to grasp some of the issues uh, that are happening or that not are happening that we've been dealing with for, for centuries in our country but it's hard to grasp issues of race and racism, systemic racism, et cetera. If you're a white Southerner, I think it's a little bit more difficult. And I think if you're a white Southern Christian or white Southern evangelical specifically, I think it's even more difficult because all of your communities, all of your formation have in many instances told you the same thing, or perhaps evangelicalism in the South has been more Southern than it has been Christian. So it was a way to just kind of unpack uh, for people, hey, here's how your racial imagination has likely been shaped and formed. Um, let's see if we can unpack this. And um, let's see if, I, I really tried to take on that role uh, of a teacher of, I, I, I opened in the introduction with talking about teaching high school and teaching high school was 
Um, I didn't expect this to happen, but teaching high school helped me become the best translator I possibly could have become. Um, because you're, you're with students every day, you're, you're with them five days a week, you begin to develop really deep relationships, even more so than college students and graduate students that you might only see a couple of times a week. Um, they're not as mature, they're still, they're still growing and learning and figuring out themselves. Uh, and you just have to kind of translate the material at a level to which they can grasp it. And so I just kind of wrote the book in that spirit of, on the one hand, thinking about the Sunday school teachers who raised me, and on the other hand, thinking about the, the high school students that I taught who they're trying to figure out what is, is happening uh, in our streets, Knoxville included. Uh, so just like, how would I explain this if I were showing up on a, on a Tuesday morning to my like, you know, Christian ethics class uh, at this high school? Really, really good. And again, I think that's just a wonderful approach, uh, Justin. Um, glad you're doing it that way. So, um, you know, given everything, what would you hope that people most take away from the book? I think it is, I structure the book with talking about my grandparents. Um, I mentioned my grandparents at the beginning and at the end, and then kind of sprinkled throughout. I have stories about my interaction with them and with family and I noticed that when both of my grandparents passed away, um, they've passed away within the last couple of years, and largely before the kind of current political uh, climate really, really shifted for far worse than it, than it has been. I realized though that even when I was writing the dissertation and I was in graduate school and I was having a lot of these thoughts, reading a lot of reading a lot of the literature that has become kind of popularized now, I realized I never talked to them about my work. And they'd ask how, you know, how's school going? And they knew that I'd been in school forever. So they always asked that year after year. And I realized like how often I chose to um, soft pedal what I was talking about or to find ways to just avoid talking about the issues that were becoming, I was becoming very passionate about and would become ultimately a good bit of this work. And, and after, after they died, I realized like, you know, my kind of complicity in, you know, the expression goes like silence is violence, or there's all kind of like phrases that are that are used. I realized too that like I was not one of the good, enlightened white folks out there, um, in part because I had not talked to, spoken to some of the people closest to me about some of these issues. Um, and it, whether it was just I thought that we could achieve this kind of false peace through silence. Um, it, I think the book is kind of working that out as well. And so what, when I talk to people now, when I talk to students or friends or even pastors who are struggling on how to preach this, I'm encouraging them from, I think, a place of failure to say, hey, have, have these tough conversations and, you know, find people who can help you figure out how to have these tough conversations. Um, because, you know, even, even if it's just your loved ones, you know, I have students who are like, I've got, you know, I've gone away to college and I've learned a lot. And now I realize a lot of my own kind of like baggage and kind of in, through my, my own like racial imagination. And I don't know how to talk to my dad. And so I, I wanted to write something for those students um, that wouldn't just blow Thanksgiving dinners up into like massive fights. Like I wanted to begin to provide like language that readers could translate for people that they love and begin to have tough conversations. Uh, so part of it is from a, a place of a little bit of failure and a little bit of shame of just going, 
of realizing I could have had these conversations. You know, my grandparents loved me. They may have disagreed with me, but what's the worst that could have happened? Um, and so I, I try to be fearless now in the classroom or with the people closest to me. Uh, but I, I feel like I've kind of learned learned the hard way. So I, I would hope people would take away from the book is I, I hope I've given you some language and some maybe anecdotes or some conceptual ways to think through how to how to have the tough conversations. Very, uh, very, very interesting and, and, and very helpful, I hope. Um, so since this is your first book and we're still kind of coming out of the pandemic, I mean, what have you learned so far about how to market it? I, I, I'm, fig- yeah, I'm certainly figuring that out as, as, as the world opens back up. Uh, so I, I've done a lot of research for the last few years on just trying to figure out how to market. Um, some of which the advice was still good, regardless of whether you're locked indoors or not. And then some of it, you, you certainly have to um, improvise. I, I think the good thing for this book and other writers right now is that things are opening back up. So uh, being able to gather together is something, I, you know, it, it's rapidly occurring and occurring right now. So I'm beginning to be able to line up things for the fall. Uh, my, my approach to marketing right now in this specific moment is to, to just be patient, to realize that uh, a lot of people just want to get out of town and go to Disney World. They may not want to pick up, they may not want to pick up a book uh, just yet, unlike white supremacy <laughs> and, and anti-racism and, and sorting through those tough things. They might. Uh, but to also just realize that like the, the book will find people when it finds people. Uh, and I've also just tried to make myself available. I mean, that's, you know, my, my website is, is on the back cover of the book and my email address is on my website. And I want people to really think of me as, as a conversation partner. Uh, but then again, I'm doing all this, the stuff that, you know, we learn about and, writing for your life seminars about doing the social media marketing and relying on the contacts that I know well um, in publishing and in school settings and church settings. Uh, So I'm, I'm, I'm excited that the book is coming out in a time when um, the world is opening back up. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, this summer is going to be interesting. I mean, I think everybody's going to be traveling, right? There's this pent up demand, as you said, to get out. And I think there's also a pent up demand to have fun, you know, yeah. which maybe is counter to some of the books like, you know, you and I have both released recently that are more serious in nature, not necessarily fun books. But uh, but also I agree with you that um, it's th- these issues aren't going to go away anytime soon. No, right? no. And they need to be dealt with. Right. So I think your patience advice is. Uh, is really good. <laughs> and I need to remember that myself as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to practice what I preach right now. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So you mentioned that, you know, you had attended a Writing for Your Life event, you know, and, and so can you talk about a little bit how that supported your work? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, and I'm in publishing now, and I guess I've been in with the other journal for um, about four years. So I knew kind of one side of the publishing world and knew a little bit from that um, perspective. But even after years of being in academia, there is still kind of, I think, a mythology built up around publishing and publishing your first book, what that should look like and who you should publish with. And I realized that uh, after I'd gathered as much intel as I could from professors and friends who had written I needed to also just hear some outside voices and you came, you know, your, you and your work had kind of come recommended from friends who had, you know, signed up for the newsletter years ago. And then um, when you came to Nashville, I jumped on it and uh, spent a, spent a day in 2019. And I think that, I think it was October of 2019 in Nashville. And um, I think it was, December of 2019 that I landed a contract for the book. Now I'd, I'd been, 
I'd been writing at that point for writing and researching for a couple of years, but had not yet put out any feelers, hadn't put out any kind of like hard proposals just yet. Um, but no, I think, I think your seminars were great in continuing that demystifying of here's what it means to publish a book and then how to, once it's published, to get it out there and get it marketed. It's not an easy thing. You know, no, it takes a lot of things that have to go right um, in order for it to happen. Yeah. Well, and I think, too, what I learned is that we all need really skilled guides to help us through that process. And I, and I, I think you were one, of, I count you as, as one of those people that a guide who came along at a, at a good time for me and added your voice in to all the other voices that were helping me out. And it, you know, it just kind of, it was uh, serendipitous, I guess, that a, a couple of months after, after the seminar, seminar had a contract in hand. So that was all exciting. Well, good, good, thank you. So um, do you have any additional plans for writing that you can talk about? Uh, I'm, I've got a couple of pieces coming out with the other journal this year, a couple of uh, mainly just book reviews, at least immediately, and uh, trying to highlight other people's really, really good works that are, uh, that are out there. I think that's what we, we love to do with the other journal is just, you know, regardless of what your credentials say, we want to highlight really excellent writing. And so, so I've, I've got a couple of book reviews of work that uh, will be coming out in 2021. And then I am, I'm in the early stages of working on book number two, but it's the early stages. And I, I don't want to say much more than that because as, as writers well know, like it could all go in the trash can within a, within a couple months, but I'm, sure. I'm in, I have enough energy to think about book number two, which is, which is, unexpected and pretty exciting. Good, good, good. Well, that's perfectly fine. I, you know, I don't expect you to say any more than that, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that you're doing it. Yeah. Well, Justin, uh, thanks so much for all of your work and for joining us to, to talk about it. Um, I'm very excited about it. I'm very excited for you and for the progress that you've made. And I really hope that uh, the book does tremendously well. Yeah. Thank you, Brian.